for the midterm? Are we going to have class or no? This Thursday? No, uh, there's no class. It's just a midterm. It will be the whole hour and 15 minutes. Uh, for clarification, today we submit uh, questions for Chapter 9, right? Yes. Okay. Chapter 8, actually. Okay. Any other questions? Um, what's the format of the exam? Is it more uh, conceptual? Well, it will be a combination of both... Uh, you know, you should uh, study what we did. Uh, we did uh, a problem on uh, uh, highway uh, last time, capacity analysis, level of services, and so on. We did the uh, problem on the network, if you remember. Make sure you understand how to do those. <coughs> and then uh, pretty much... Uh, all the questions that you submitted, I, I will have a combination of those questions on your exam. So uh, make sure you study those questions. Um, so it's a combination of questions and, and problems. Any other questions? So make sure you read your chapter in your book. Make sure you know where everything is. So if I ask a question, then you maybe refer to your book to answer those questions or refer to your own questions. So it's a pretty much open book, uh, open notes. So uh, the only thing is that you have a time limit. So uh, you really cannot go and search around too much because then you are wasting your time. So you have to be prepared for it. All right, any other questions? No more questions. All right. So on remaining chapter eight, I think a couple of things left that we have to do. Um, we have done the level of service. I mentioned <laughs> those and I did the example problem that's in the book. Come on, make sure you review that and you understand what level of services are and how do you compute that and what table you use and so on. One thing that we do usually, we do land use studies. So the land use studies uh, uh, we, we try to do, typically the planner, we try to do at least the following techniques on the land use studies. Though they do land use survey. And then they do land use classification. And they do vacant uh, land use study. And they do presentation storage of land use data. Okay, this is, uh, these are the steps that usually a planner do. Usually on the land use survey, 
they do a field study, they do by inspection method or inspection interviews. And those are the two methods that they do. By inspection method, they try to figure out, you know, uh, how, how's the land use? Uh, uh, for instance, is it high density residential area or what? So they, they pretty much uh, look at it and survey it. And then by interview, they just ask people about the land use type that they have. Um, so, but these days, because we have the internet, we can even do land use survey through internet. Because if you go to the Google map, pretty much you can do the uh, land use survey through Google map. So uh, those are the method that is being used. Um, and then uh, on the land use classification, we try to figure out again, what is the classification of land use, uh, such as, as I mentioned that, is it the high density residential area, low density residential area, or what type of uh, density do we have on a resident, low density, medium density, high density, or retail businesses. Um, and uh, we try to figure out the transportation utilities uh, that is located in that area or industries and related, uh, you know, uh, uses, um, type of uh, uh, wholesale or related uses, public buildings, open spaces. So those are actually pretty much uh, our listed on a, a table, which we call table 8-8. You can look at those type of classification that we have uh, on page uh, 347. So those are the ones that I men mentioned to you. And then on the vacant land use, um, we try to figure out, um, is there any vacant land around that area? And then um, there we call some, some lands are prime uh, land. Uh, those are the type of land that are uh, pretty much available for development. It has um, low uh, slopes uh, and uh, the utilities are uh, are already there and so on. So those are prime land. And then there are some other types that it needs to be, it's marginal and uh, needs to be uh, improved on. Uh, so those are the categories that they have. Class one is a prime, class two are prime and marginal. So depends on the type of the land that we have, the slopes that it is, is it satisfactory for residential area or not? So those are the differentiation between these two types of uh, classification. And then we have presentation storage of land use data. We do the land use map. So any, any uh, uh, city that you go to, uh, regional planning, they have a land use map you can get hold of. They give you, with a, it's a colorful map that pretty much shows different land use in that map. Uh, or sometimes they have it in a tabular form. And, uh, and uh, or a lot of cities right now, they have computerized this land use uh, storage and presentation so you can get access to that. Um, now, um, we do, uh, I will talk about those volume studies and so on. I did talk about it a little bit before, um, but we'll talk about it later on. But I wanna get into 
another topic, so environmental impact of transportation, which is pretty important. So you can read that on page 252. So what are the major elements of the environmental impact? So that's a big issue because a lot of times when you wanna build a highway and we wanna build a rail system, airport, any types of transportation facilities, they require us to write a traffic impact report which is called EIR. And that it should include uh, all the impacts that that project has on the surrounding area, environmental impact. And that's a very important document because uh, without that document, they will not allow us to build. And uh, so we have to state all the impact that that transportation system has on environment. So the major environmental impact of transportation is one is a noise and two is air pollution. And three is water pollution. And runoff changes and then four is a long and short term land use and socioeconomic changes. Okay, so those are the four uh, environmental impact that we should pay attention to it. As far as noise pollution is, you know, noise is unwanted sound. So anything that's unwanted sound, we call it noise pollution. Obviously, um, the automobile generate a lot of noise, unwanted sounds that we have to um, prepare for it. Uh, other types of transportation mode, which is having, having a very high noise pollution is the aircraft which produce a noise from their engine and and that is a, a environmental impact so when we are building an airport and there are residential area around it that those people suffer from the noise of the aircraft uh, for instance uh, people who live in the uh, close to the lax like westchester those cities uh, are suffering from the noise pollution. Um, then uh, we have obviously noise pollution that generate by other modes of transportation. Rail system, for instance, uh, has a high noise pollution and so on. Um, so the noise has a magnitude of sound and uh, usually is considered to be uh, measured uh, as the decibel. So the magnitude of sound is measured by decibel. Okay, uh, so for instance, uh, we might have a intensity of a sound of 10 decibel. Uh, 
the ear is very sensitive with respect to that decibel. Um, and then there is a frequencies of the range uh, that is affecting again on our ears. So overall, there are different decibels by measured by different uh, types of a, um, aircraft or by any types of a, 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 any type of a facilities that causes noise. For instance, uh, just give you an idea. Um, a large uh, a vacuum cleaner with three meter from you generate about 70 decibels. Um, a rock band, it generates about 110 bit decibels, which is very, very high. Uh, we can bear almost around 80, 70 to 80 decibels, but above that is very, very uh, bothersome. Um, like a bedroom uh, at night or uh, any type of a background of uh, music will be, it could be just a 30 decibel, but then uh, it gets higher as we have a noisier uh, types of uh, uh, equipments. Um, so we have to be aware of it. And uh, we have to have some barrier in order to control that. Um, with regard to the highways, you have seen it probably. We are building walls in areas that uh, are pretty high noise. And then uh, in order to protect the residential area from that noise. On the aircraft type, um, some airport have a curfew so that they can not fly after, for instance, 10 o'clock at night. Uh, because of the noise that they generate and affect the resident, resident around that area. Uh, so there are curfew. In some airports, they even pay a fee to people who live around that area uh, for the noise that the airport generates. Um, so those are some of the mitigations that they do. The important thing is that on the noise is the, that really affect is that um, uh, the, could you hold on one second? I have to get my charger. Okay. Um, the important about the noise is that one is the length of duration of the sound. And, uh, and the two is the number of times the sound is repeated. Uh, can you repeat number one? Okay, length of the duration of the sound. How long does it take? And the number two is the number of times the sound is repeated. And the third one is the time of day. At which the noise occurs.
Okay, so um, so that is the impact that we find that very important. All right. I don't want to get into too much of a detail of modeling of the noise and so on, which is actually for aircraft noise. We have it on page 254 and 255. You can read those if you want. And then the traffic noise by highways, that's on page uh, um, 256. Um, so you can read about highway noise and airport noise or aircraft noise on those two pages and get an idea about what we are talking about, okay? Now, the second effect that is very important on environmental impact is the air pollution. The air pollution is very important. Almost 70% of the air pollution is caused by automobile. So it is, uh, automobile is uh, very important on creating air pollution. Now, what are the elements of the air pollution? The elements of the air pollution is, one is the carbon monoxide. carbon monoxide. And this is a, a byproduct of internal combustion engine of the automobile. Um, and is usually is uh, generated substantially by engine that are not working very well. And these are poisonous gas that causes dizziness and headaches and, and uh, so we have to be very careful about that. The second one is what we call oxide of nitrogen. Oxide of nitrogen. <coughs> Again, that's the same thing as the product of the combustion uh, is the production of nitric acid and nitrogen dioxide. And uh, so this is a major component of the smog as you see it usually every day and causes very severe breathing problems. And uh, even the concentration of it is high. And the third one, is called hydrocarbonous. Hydrocarbons. Um, uh, this is largely because of the poor again combustion and um, from the leaking exhaust of the car um, so again we have to make sure that there is a, a, you know there are chemical uh, oxidizing chemical of smog and mainly ozone um, so um, are very toxic. And then the fourth one is the ozone. That's a photochemical oxidant in the form of ozone. Uh, this is a, a pollutant that usually uh, is a cause of photochemical reaction in the atmosphere um, so it can cause eye and noise and throat and lung irritation and damages vegetation um, usually ozone is a light gray appearance and can be causing a decrease in visibility 
That's why sometimes when you cannot see far away is because of the ozone. And then five is we call particulates. Those are particulates in the atmosphere. They are pretty high, highly visible. And um, again, those are uh, uh, very uh, harmful to lungs and uh, throat and so on. And uh, they consider it very dangerous actually because their association with the respiration problems and um, increase uh, even uh, uh, damages to the plant and so on. Uh, for instance, when we just experienced like they were showing on TV the other day that China had the biggest sandstorm that pretty much nobody could see across in uh, the whole uh, atmosphere was all gray. This was pretty much a lot of particulate uh, that inf uh, inf infiltrate into a lung and is very harm harmful. So those are the elements, of major elements of the air pollution that we have to pay attention to it. And uh, as I said, almost 70% of that air pollution is caused by automobile. That's why, you know, we have all this control over automobiles, inspections and, and make sure that uh, the engine is running well and, and so on, um, because they are very, very harmful. Uh, like Los Angeles is experiencing uh, one of the worst cities as far as this air pollution is concerned. And then there are uh, um, water pollution effects. On the water pollution effects, on transportation projects are usually pretty small in comparison with the noise and air pollution. But um, the paving of the areas such as highway, airport, parking lots, and other construction activities can produce substantial increase in the runoff into the local streams. So by doing those construction, we might have a water pollution. Um, uh, so it might affect our groundwater. Uh, and it might cause contamination there and so on. But as I said, compared to the air pollution uh, and noise pollution, that is the major part of the airport, uh, uh, environmental impact is pretty small. And the long and short term land use effect. Um, the construction of the transportation facilities can cause a long-term and even short-term um, effects. Uh, these are the land use changes that sometimes benefit the community and sometimes is harmful. Um, so when you are developing a a high density, for instance, residential area. Um, so those could be actually, uh, um, by, by doing that, then you have a type of a transportation system such as rail and rapid transit that uh, take people away from those areas. Uh, and sometimes what happened, it causes the development. For instance, in the Bay Area, I remember when I was living there, 
when they built the BART system, Bay Area Rapid Transit, uh, that started to connect the East, uh, East Bay, they call it, to San Francisco. And uh, this is the BART system that they developed that because the San Francisco was a high density residential area and um, or commercial area, the rents and the buying the houses were very expensive. So a lot of people, because of this BART system that was developed, they decided to depart from San Francisco and live in the East Bay. So they went into the East Bay and these areas were not developed at that time. But because of the BART that was uh, Bay Area Rapid Transit, people decided that they can buy a cheaper houses uh, far away a little bit from San Francisco and therefore commuting to San Francisco by uh, BART system. So that causes the development or land use changes in the area where actually before was a very, very low density area. So some cities such as Concord and Walnut Creek and other types of cities, uh, Moraga and so on, were developed along this part system. Um, and uh, and that, was big, that was a long-term effect of the land use on those areas. And sometimes when you build a highway, uh, go from one point to another point, and then you see oh, after. That you, you mute that microphone, please. Um, so when you're building a highway, that you see sometimes that a few gas station is developed beside the highways, and people who work in that gas station build a house and so on. So a community get developed along that highway. And that is the land use effect that could be short term or long term. Um, so those are the effects that it, it creates. Now, as I mentioned that uh, before, one of the things that we have to do is any types of transportation project that we want to do, we have to create uh, environmental impact studies. Before we can build a project, we have to do that. So <clears throat> what are the uh, guidelines that we have to do in order to pre uh, provide that? Well, some of the things in that report or that we have to write is as follows. We have to write what are the impacts that are expected to be environmentally controversial. Okay, what are the impacts that are expected to be controversial? Is it air pollution, noise pollution, whatever it is. The second thing that we have to do on that is significant um, impacts. on natural cultural ecological uh, or scenic resources
including effects on wetlands and endangered flora and uh, three significant effects on protected or historical site unprotected historical site okay and uh, four will be significant effects on local and regional planning and developments. Um, Significant increase in surface traffic congestion. Okay, that's number five. All right. Okay, basically, what you can do is uh, if you look at page 260. Okay, you can read these from page 260. I will just read the rest of them. Okay, and you can read that and those are pretty much is written there for you. Impact that are inconsistent with federal, state and lo local environmental statement and uh, large relocation requirement or lack of suitable relocating housing increase of noise impact or noise sensitive area, significant deterioration impact of air quality. Okay, and then uh, any other action with significant impact on business environment. So those are the uh, concern or things that you have to write about in that environmental impact studies. Okay, that's what you have to do. So just read it, those are the, uh, on page at the bottom of the page 260, all right? Um, so without that environmental impact report, we cannot really build anything. So we gotta have that. Most of the project has a very, very big environmental impact that they work on it for some time, years. Um, so simply environmental impact report is not only um, written for the adverse impact. Uh, you have to write the good impact also, such as if you build a, a highway uh, or a rail system, maybe you are helping to develop the areas around that you improve the employments uh, and there are a lot of good things that, that you can even state it in, the, in your environmental impact report. And then obviously all the bad effects such as air pollution, noise pollution, land use changes, and all those things has to be stated. 
part of that environmental impact report is a section we call it traffic impact report. So that is what is this one is increasing traffic congestion. So we have to write a traffic impact report, which we will talk about that in the next week or two about how to write a traffic impact report, which actually we have to state that if when we are building this uh, facilities, whatever it is, what would be the impact on the surrounding area? It, does it increase the congestion? Does it decrease the congestion or what, what will happen? And so these are all stated in environmental impact report, we call it EIR. So you probably hear that a lot if you have in any type of a construction or transportation, you always have to write the EIR, okay? So those are the list of things that you have to write about, okay? Any question on that? Okay, that's pretty much, uh, you should do your reading on that chapter eight. That's pretty much what we have to talk about. Now, we're gonna start chapter nine. Any question before I go to chapter nine? All right, on chapter nine, if you remember the land use model was the seven steps that we discussed. Uh, one was population um, and two was economic projections and uh, three was land use and the fourth was generation models. So what we're gonna talk about, we're gonna talk about the about trip generation model. So what is the trip generation model? Well, the trip generation model is a process that uh, provides relationship between urban activities and travel. Okay, urban activities and travel. But before I do that, I wanna just give you uh, what is the urban transportation planning process. Okay, let's talk about trip generation model a little later. So we're gonna talk about urban transportation planning. Um, it, it's a long range planning. Urban transportation planning is a long range planning that start after World War II. So it's a long long range planning, which started after World War II. Because of rapid growth. Of cities. Population and economic activities. Okay, so that urban transportation plan. Now, the Federal Highway Act of 1962.
requires that every urban area with population of 50,000 or more to have urban transportation planning. Okay. They should have urban transportation planning. That's a Federal Highway Act of 1962 that required that every urban area that has a population of 50,000 or more should have urban transportation planning. Now, what was the urban transportation planning requires? They said that the the, trans, the urban transportation planning should be three C's. Should be three C's. And what is that three C's? Okay. Are you guys okay? I'll go to the next page. Yeah. Okay. Should be three C's. What's the three C's? They said the urban transportation planning should be continuing so that The plan can be modified to meet changing needs. Okay, so it should be continued so that the plan can be modified to meet changing needs. What does that mean? Means that let's say we are assuming or we are planning to build a highway. Let's say we forecast that we need the highway 25 years from now and the highway should be maybe uh, 16 lanes. That's the forecast. That's the highway that we need 25 years from now because of the population growth, economic activities, everything that's happening. We need a highway that should be eight lanes in each direction, 16 lanes. But obviously we don't need the whole highway 16 lanes today. We probably need four lanes each direction. So you probably need eight lanes at this time. But as the number of automobile grows, population grows, then we need 16 lanes in the future. So what we do is that we usually go and, and obtain the land. So dedicate the land to the 16 lanes Make sure you have that. And as you have seen in some highways that we have built uh, the four lane on each side and the big median is there in for the future development because we have done economic analysis and we found out that we don't need to build the whole thing today. Maybe 10 years later or 15 years later, we add the other lanes. So that's our decision today. But they said that your plan should be continuing. That means you should not stick with this plan for the whole 25 years. If let's say five years or 10 years from now, a new technology has been developed 
that we could use that land to move people better than just a regular lane, we should adopt that. So we can modify it to meet the changing needs, whatever we need. So your plan should be always continuing. We should always visit our plan and see what else we can do with the new technology. And maybe we have to change our mind about just adding another eight lane to it. So that's what the continuum means. So it's a continuing process. It's not just one time decision, okay? The second thing that they said, it should be comprehensive. So should be responsible for the planning of all public publicly owned transportation facilities. within a metropolitan areas. So that means we should take all modes of transportation into account. We cannot just say only highways. We should take into account rail system, bus system, all publicly owned transportation facilities. So it should be a comprehensive plan. And it should be coordinated by coordinate. That means that it should be, must be coordinated with land use. So we should coordinate with land use. So this is where the C's are. One, two, three. They say should be three C's. Continuing, comprehensive and coordinated. And what do we mean by coordinated with land use? If I have a land use map of an area, and this is the high density residential area, this is the medium density, and this is a low density, okay? And this is the commercial, and this is the industrial. You know that the rail system, for instance, a rapid transit or metro is not suitable to move people from low density residential area to commercial area or industrial area. Because low density residential areas are pretty much single family homes. So the density is low. So if you build a metro that goes from this area to here, that's not a good mode of transportation because people have to drive a long distance to get to the metro station in order to go to the commercial. And there are not too many people because it's a low density residential area. So when we are saying coordinate with land use, means if you have a low density residential area, you wanna build a transportation system, Maybe you have to consider bus system if you are talking about the mass transit, not the rail system, because rail system is not going to be effective. But on the high density residential is the opposite. 
high density residential is those high rise buildings. So there are a lot of people are concentrated in that area. So it has a very high density. Number of people per mile is very, very high. So the ridership on that Metro is gonna be high. So if you build a rail system or a Metro system from high density residential area to commercial or industrial, that will be effective. So that's what we should do. The other one, medium density or low density, maybe a bus system works. So we have to look at our land use and coordinate our transportation system with the land use. That's what it means, coordinated. Okay, so they said that the urban transportation plan it should be three Cs. So any area, urban area that has a population of 50,000 or more, they should have a transportation planning. Now, if they decide that they don't want to have it or they don't have it, then they don't get federal funding. And you know, most of the major expenditure in the transportation system infrastructure, it comes from the federal government. So if you don't get the money from federal government, pretty much you're out of luck. You cannot really build them because they are very expensive. You need millions and millions of dollars and those has to come from federal government. So for that reason, every urban area had the transportation planning, urban transportation planning process, okay? So that's what it means, all right? We don't have enough time to start on that trip generation. I advise you to watch the video that I put there, okay? And that talk about the trip generation. So watch that one time and then read your chapter and we'll discuss the methods of modeling and finding out how many trips is being produced or how many trips being attracted in any zone. That's what we try to do. No, it will not be. Okay? So trip generation would not be, but everything up to this point will be. Okay, so study these next time for the exam. Okay, study hard. As I said, pay attention to what I did in the beginning. And uh, no, you don't have to study all night. Just study a couple hours at least, all right? Okay, so, uh, one, so deep, yeah, deep, one deep. thing that you pay, you pay attention is that you have to locate everything that's in your book and your notes that in case there is a question that comes, for instance, if I ask you this question, so you know where it is, so you can, you know, uh, read it and, and write it, okay? So that shows the difference between somebody who study and somebody who didn't study because the question might not be very surprising, but you just have to know where it is and how you get the answer. Any question? All right, I will take a note of the pages or chapters that you did this study and then hopefully you guys do well. All right. If there's no question, we'll end the session tonight and then we'll talk to you on Thursday. Thank you guys.